It is a pleasure to welcome everyone to this breakout session, which is called Interdisciplinary Approaches to Addressing Real World Problems. My name is Brad Coleman. I'm the director of the Curriculum Fellows Program at Harvard Medical School. The CFP is a postdoctoral teaching and curriculum development focused training program for basic scientists. I'm happy to be one of your co-hosts for this session, and I'm going to start us off with a little bit of context. Uh, as was really clear and nice to see from some of the responses we got to the intro poll question, you know, we heard about the fact that uh, working within our disciplines really helps us coalesce around shared approaches and understandings, language, uh, resources were mentioned. Um, and disciplines and this expertise really, they become essential aspects of the university because they provide space and tools to build the deep understanding that we associate with being in the academy. But we also know that when we leave the academy and start to consider the more messy, complicated problems that animate the broader world, these very rarely fall within a single discipline. And sometimes that narrow disciplinary focus that's so valuable in some circumstances starts to seem insufficient. So the complexity and interconnectedness of real world problems require that if we're going to be authentic and effective in our approaches to understand them, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. And then we bring our students into the mix. And so one of our goals is to share this sophisticated, authentic understanding of real world problems with our students. The challenge becomes stepping out of our own discipline, out of our own comfort zone as teachers and as researchers to work with our colleagues across disciplinary boundaries and help our students really understand and embrace the complexity of these problems. And this defies a lot of what we think of as conventional course design and it really requires a lot of innovative and collaborative effort. And that's what brings us to the session today. So we are thrilled today to be joined by four faculty that represent three different courses that all took on this challenge and engage students in the difficult work of learning across disciplinary boundaries and understanding problems that confront us out in the real world. We're gonna break up the session into two segments today. We're calling the first one before the course, and we'll use this time to explore how these different courses came together. And the second segment is called during the course, and that one will focus more on the issues of the student experience and how the course actually ran. And there will be opportunities to hear audience voices in each of these segments, and we'll provide the details about how we'll actually do that when the time comes. So now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Rebecca, who will introduce our panelists and kick off our discussion. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Nesson. Um, I am the Dean of Academic Programs at the School of Engineering, um, and I also teach in the Computer Science Department. Um, a longtime fan and member of the HILT community, so I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. Um, as Brad mentioned, we have gathered four faculty from three different courses. Um, these courses all together have many more than four faculty participating. We're really delighted to have these four here to share their experiences with us. So um, we will be hearing from the Faculty of Engineering Sciences 27 um, with the, the very evocative title of Aesthetic Pleasure and Smart Design, Janice Faces the Future. Um, this is a course taught by Doris Summer, um, who is the Ira Jewell Williams Jr. Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures and uh, African and African American Studies, and uh, co-taught with Fawaz Habal, who is a senior lecturer on applied physics in the School of Engineering and uh, recently stepped down as the executive dean for education in the School of Engineering. Um, so a close colleague of mine. Um, we will also be hearing from Alain Viel, who is uh, the lead instructor, but with many collaborators who are not listed co-instructors of um, LPCE 101, a studio lab on creativity. It's a course on entrepreneurship for undergraduates um, taught by a biologist. So there's a, there's a lot going on there in the interdisciplinary um, things that are being drawn into what students are learning in that course. And we're joined by Salman Keshavji. Um, he is the, oh, and I forgot to say about Alain, sorry about that, um, that he is a senior lecturer on molecular and cellular biology and the director of the Northwest Undergraduate Labs. Um, we're also joined by Salman Kashavji, the director of the Medical School Center for Global Health Delivery, um, an associate professor of medicine and professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he is one of four faculty co-teaching a course in our undergraduate general education program, um, which is called Who Lives, Who Dies, 
Who Cares, Gen N 1093, um, which he teaches together with Arthur Kleinman, Ann Becker, and Paul Farmer. So thank you all for being here with us. And we're gonna start off with an introductory question, which we're going to ask each course group to respond to, um, to just give us all an understanding of what the project is that you're undertaking in your course. So um, I'll start um, with Salman and ask, what is the real world problem as the gen ed program puts it or big picture educational goal of your course and um, can you tell us why and how you decided to use interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity to address that problem thanks rebecca and thanks brad it's great to be here today so gen ed 1093 is uh, who lives who dies who cares case studies in global health and from the title you can probably tell that we're we're really um trying to examine global health as a set of problems and uh, uh, kind of focused on, on, on how to get people the care that they need. And of course, when you, when you start to think of that, you're immediately, you know, you're, you're immediately confronted with the question of why some people get care and some people don't and the distributive mechanisms around care, et cetera. So when people think about health you know, and health delivery, I, I think most people realize that it's rooted in the social world in really complex ways. But at first blush, it you know, usually appears useful to view it as kind of a biological phenomenon on its own and say, well, we have HIV in country X, let's say HIV in South Africa. But we don't want our students to stop there. We want, because you know, let's say, let, let me just play this out with, with the HIV example. You know, you could say there's HIV in South Africa, TB, tuberculosis is the biggest killer of people with HIV. And we, we, have, we know the scientific mechanisms of how they relate to each other and one epidemic will fuel the other. And you could end the discussion there, but we don't want people to do that because when you're thinking about why South Africa, why not somewhere else? You know, why is the response being a certain way there versus the way it was responded to say in France, right? And you suddenly realize that, that that these that the the health questions that we're <clears throat> we're asking are linked to colonialism and other systems of extraction. They're linked to specific modes of idea transmission that limit what is done and can be done. So, for example, bureaucracies, like the work of Max Weber, is a great example. Um, <clears throat> modes of controlling populations and shaping human beings in populations. So the work of the philosopher Michel Foucault is an example of that. You, 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 you realize that it's linked to modes of thinking that predominate in the world today, like neoliberalism and some of the economic ideas that have followed from that particular political philosophy. And then you, you know, as you're thinking of solutions, you also realize that those may be linked to different ways of imagining the world, ideas of accompaniment, ideas of accountability, ideas of empathy, ways of caregiving, right? So, as you can see, it's not just about the biology of it. And so by definition, you have to draw from multiple uh, disciplines. The, and, and then, you know, when you realize that, you realize you could do that in different ways, right? You could just have a course on the history of healthcare, like in a history of science course. So you could just have, have uh, something that just looks at the biology or the epidemiology of a disease. But what we're challenging our students in this course is to look at this as a biosocial phenomenon, something that where the biology and the social are intimately linked. And it's the very interactions between the biological and the social world that are important. And hence, we get to the, the fact that, you know, in order to be able to do that, you need to have uh, uh, something between an interdisciplinary and a, sorry, between a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary analysis. You need to be drawing from disciplines and tying them together in different ways rather than just having these multiple disciplines stand alone and talk about this. Because if you don't understand the history and you don't understand the, the anthropology and you don't understand the, the social space, it makes the biology very difficult to deal with. And it actually, uh, it, it constrains your, the vision that you can have for the solutions that we need to, to, to deliver healthcare. So that's what we're trying to do. And I think, you know, we've, we've, uh, but you will talk about this more, I'm sure, but we've, you know, we've managed because this, this course is taught by anthropologist physicians. I think we've managed to really be able to bring that interdisciplinary space, uh, uh, you know, to the classroom. Thank you. Um, it's, you know, you've done such a great job of uh, 
expressing the messiness and the tendrils that come out from any problem that might arise. And I hope that we will then go forward and start to think about well, how can you pull that back together into something that we can, you know, the students can make sense of in a semester. Um, so moving now to a course that I know is very much focused on the, the idea of approaching something open-ended um, and how do you begin to formulate a way to get there. I'd like to um, uh, turn to Doris and Fawaz and ask you that same question. What is the central educational goal um, of your course and how are you using and why are you using interdisciplinarity to approach it? Well, uh, I can start with uh, the first lesson I learned from Fawaz. Uh, and it's very much in the line of uh, what we just learned from Salman. And that is when you approach uh, a real problem, you realize that uh, it's connected with everything else on the map of the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you can't cure a, a disease if you don't have education, if you don't have potable water, if you don't have gender equity. Uh, all of those 16 goals, uh, including the, the collaboration, are necessary to tackle any one of those uh, wicked problems. So that's the opening uh, of our conversation uh, between Fawaz and myself. And uh, one of the sequels, and here I'll, um, I'll just invite Fawaz to say what's on his mind. One of the sequels to that lesson uh, was that the UN did not take enough account of um, innovation and art. Because when you look at problems as if they're zero sum games and you don't factor in innovation and art, uh, you um, understand problems, but you don't know how to intervene in them. So I, I just want to give an example from public health uh, because it, it wasn't the, the focus. We didn't have a particular field of focus uh, in our course because uh, it, it really is a conceptual course. Uh, but with, um, with public health, uh, we found that uh, doing uh, an artistic activity like forum theater, which we did in, in uh, our course with Fawaz as well, uh, where we act out everyday tragedies and consider them the first act of works that then figure out interventions in those tragedies. Uh, that turned out to be uh, more informative in terms of anthropological information uh, than anyone would have imagined. And um, when, when we have time, I'd love to uh, develop that. But, um, but basically it's the, the spark of innovation of art as interruption in systems. That's what art is. It, uh, it looks at paradigms and says, what am I going to do with it? And when people think about culture from a social scientific uh, perspective, culture looks like a given um, set of shared beliefs, practices, things. But when you look at culture, the same word with an irreconcilable definition, from the artistic point of view, culture is the interruption of all those inherited packages. So uh, I think that's part of the excitement that I felt in the collaboration with Fawaz. We were looking at engineering and at art as ways uh, to address uh, paradigms and not just to understand them. Yeah, Fawaz. Okay, uh, so very much like uh, actually Salman summarized it really nicely in some sense. Uh, when you start talking about uh, complexity and problems, uh, the word complexity has many connotations, but uh, it's very different from something complex. Uh, it's, it's, it talks about situations where you have a interaction between many elements, and these are interactions are nonlinear, meaning some can affect others more than what you'd expect. There are these feedback loops that comes back. Uh, Vikram here on the call, I guess, with us, and he and I also talk about that a lot around uh, how we look at uh, problems and how we can examine uh, uh, examine them by looking at uh, mapping these problems and trying to figure out what component exists and how they are interacting. Uh, 
that's very important to distinguish that from things that are complicated where they are they could have many components but these components are not interacting so when when we look at design design as a problem solving methodology we think about it as a good tool that we can engage uh, students in learning method, uh, methods and processes such as they can go and address these complex and that part of uh, the reason of, uh, of doing this course and yet uh, at the same time we were having in mind like uh, you know, what are the things, what kind of provocations that we can really use from art to enhance the, the let me say, the depth and methodology of uh, addressing these problems. And uh, many times I pose the questions like, uh, okay, if we can design it, should we? And uh, I take the position where today anything can be designed. Given money and time, anything you can design, anything you want to dream about, you can make. But then the question is, uh, why and what kind of consequences these designs can lead to and uh, what kind of solution can bring to. So it, it's a more of a, let me use the word here, more of a, I mean, the word interdisciplinarity here comes to mind, of course, but uh, to me, it's a question like of a, more like a, uh, when I'm hearing uh, Doris or maybe she's also hearing me, we are more like a, uh, visitors of a different land. We examine things, we think about them, we look at things and we don't uh, take them for granted. And the students do the same thing with us. So we created a methodology of examination that's somewhat deep, takes time to do. At the same time, it's uh, somewhat provocative because if you don't know something, you could say, I don't know. And that was really one of the powers that we implemented uh, in our discussions. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, we ask others to continue. So now, Rebecca, it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you, Fawaz. I um, had trouble getting myself off mute there. Um, but I got very excited even just at the beginning with a connection that I hadn't fully made before, which is the this the focus on the sustainable development goals. And so, Ama, I want to go to you and um, ask to hear a little bit about your course, which I know um, has a deep history in the sustainable development goals and is new this year, um, the way that it's being offered. And I'm wondering, will you tell us about this new studio LPCE 101 course that's happening this term? And what's the project, um, the, the academic goal for the students this term in your course? Yes. So uh, it, it's in fact initially based on five versions, iteration of a study abroad program that we had in Paris about solving issues in a, in a city. And you realize that, you know, you have the same issues from one city to the next, uh, the same social uh, uh, problems. And um, the, one of the reasons why uh, it was brought on during the academic year as, as a course, initially in this last spring as a two credit course and now as a four credit course, is to, we, we, we started to realize that when we, when we talk to students and we ask them what they do uh, as extracurricular activities, we realized that students have an appetite to uh, address social issues uh, in our society and that uh, they, you know, inequality, social justice, health care, uh, uh, climate change. So they have this interest, but they can do that as an extracurricular activity. They didn't have much opportunity to have that in a context of course, where if you don't know what to do to start a project, maybe to go on and then you know, create a startup, they had limited amount of, 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 course, of courses that could help them. So they, they were a little bit on their own. And uh, what we also thought is that what this course can do is bring in mentors, you know, a, a big part of uh, developing projects and, 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 and starting to solve problems is networking. And so, so that was uh, uh, an important aspect that we wanted to bring uh, uh, to the course. So uh, initially, the, the, the driver of the course was uh, the, the, the 17 SDGs. Um, and we kind of uh, build the course around, because you know, it's 
happened that we just started the course with the pandemic. Uh, so we, 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 we kind of also use uh, COVID or the pandemic as a catalyst. And uh, uh, what, you know, what, what we realize is that with, with, with the pandemic and with COVID, it just exacerbated issues that have been in the society for many, many years. And uh, so what we want uh, students to do is to develop projects that are addressing uh, mainly three issues right now. It's uh, climate change, uh, 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 inequality, and health. Uh, because we, you know, we have to kind of limit, limit ourselves. But uh, what we want them to do is to propose solutions to create not what people call the new normal, which I don't know, you know when the new normal will be uh, in place, but it's to create a better norm. And so I think that it's more important. It's not just to say, oh, now the pandemic is over, so you know, we have you know, few things to adjust. Uh, you know, we, we make sure that we get vaccinated. We make sure that we are, we are not, you know, uh, misbehaving. But, but, but that does not solve the problems that were there before, that were even worse now. So we want them to create a better, a, 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 a better future, a, a, a better normal. And so, um, so that's what we, we, we want to do. And so we are bringing students uh, from and, and, and from all field of concentrations, um, and uh, we ask them to develop project on their own, of their own choosing. So it's, we we are not you know telling them this is a set of three projects and do whatever you want. So what what we provide them is um, information about how to implement a project from the start to the end, or to develop it. Uh, and if they want, they can continue, they can go to the iLab, they can you know, create a startup, that's up to them. But initially, they have to figure out what project they want to develop and uh, what is really, uh, 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 you know, what they feel is important, what kind of problem they want to solve. So we don't want to force them into, into, into a specific project. So students don't have to come with their own project, but we we kind of uh, uh, we help them to develop their project, and so so that's you know basically how we we you know build the course. Thank you. May I, may I, I in here, Rebecca? May I? Yes, uh, please. I want to follow on what Alain said uh, in in the spirit of all these uh, collaborations because when when you say that you want them to develop. Uh, proposal. Uh, this is part of our, uh, our approach as well. We know that the human condition is creative. That's something that I study in aesthetic theory. The human condition is creative uh, and everyone uh, is a potential artist. Um, Joseph Beuys made that popular uh, as, a, as a slogan, but it comes from enlightenment philosophy. And when students understand themselves as creative beings, they become responsible for developing proposals for solutions. So uh, I want to say that um, I also collaborate with um, Tarun Khanna on a course on entrepreneurship because students there uh, have to understand that being an entrepreneur is being an artist. We're all artists in our particular ways. And so this is another way that aesthetics uh, and engineering come together. So uh, I, I wanted to just make a footnote on, uh, on what you said, Alan, thank you. Thank you, Doris. And I know Brad has a next sequence of questions, but I can't help just noting in this the, the um, activist element that comes through in each of these course problems um, or objectives that you've laid out for us. And um, what something Alain said really st stuck with me is that putting it in the context of the course and in the context of a dialogue like Fawaz and Doris are having allows students to start to approach really big, messy problems that really need, require change in the world, but with some of that support and mentorship and vis 
vision into how somebody with real academic depth and expertise is able to approach those kind of problems. Um, over to you, Brad. Yeah, thanks. That, that's a really great point, Rebecca. And I'm actually looking forward in our, in our second half, we're going to talk a lot more about, um, you know, the student experience in the course, which I think, you know, that really speaks to you. So I'm looking forward to that. I want to take, you know, one a uh, couple minutes now to just maybe wrap up this conversation about how these courses really came to be. And so I want to go back to Salman uh, a bit. And you mentioned when you were talking about the importance of the team of uh, medical anthropologists as like an, an essential component of how you built this course. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about you know, how that team came together. You know, was this an organic uh, idea that sprang up among colleagues or, you know, was there more of a uh, process to that? And then once you got everyone together, how did you then, you know, identify the goals that you all shared for this course across your, your different fields and interests? Well, Brad, it's a great question. It, it was, I guess it was very organic. So um, in around 2008, Arthur Kleinman, uh, Paul Farmer and Jim Kim, you know, were really looking at the gap in, uh, in, in the way health problems were being addressed, that they weren't really, like a biosocial analysis was not being applied. And they thought, why don't we, uh, you know, why don't we create a course uh, that would look at how, you know, bringing social theory together with practice and really trying to, to figure out, you know, how to, to, to use that as the basis for, for, um, for addressing some of the, the, you know, the health problems of our times. And um, it kind of morphed because Jim Kim left, uh, left the university, went to be the president of Dartmouth and then you know, later the World Bank. And when he left, uh, Paul and Arthur asked Ann Becker and I to join. And it was, it was at that point that we kind of did a little bit of a rethink, but not, not a lot. You know, all of us, the first three people that had taught the first year and then the four of us thereafter, We'd always been we'd been working in, on healthcare delivery in communities, right? And so we'd all been trained as anthropologists under Arthur. We were all his students, so that was one interesting thing. And and I don't know if you know this, but the medical anthropology program at Harvard um, is born, you know, is 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 has has two very strong traditional aspects to it. One is it's a very political economic analysis of healthcare and healthcare delivery. And so I think you know coming from Arthur, we had that. And then we also have all been and are faculty in the social medicine department. Um, uh, and so there's this tradition of, of social medicine and the tradition of social medicine, you know, it, it, I don't know if everyone knows about the, you know, the, the, the uh, origins of social medicine, but really they, they, it, it, it originated in the mid uh, uh, 19th century, um, probably earlier, but formally in the mid 19th century, with, with commentators who were looking at the social conditions of health, people like like uh, like Frederick Engels and people like Rudolf Virchow, and you know, and really because you know you don't have uh, germ theory and things like that, you you really are are drawn to looking at the political economy and what is driving the situation, uh, you know, at that point. So we're we're from that school, and you've got four people. You know, Arthur is a China scholar, as most people will know. You know, he, he, for years, for the last uh, 50 years, he's been looking at psychiatric disease and categories of disease and illness cross-culturally and has this very strong uh, tradition of working across disciplines. In fact, I think he's working with Fawaz at the engineering school on, on you know, like on, on different technologies to do elder care and other things. And so, so you have him, you've got Paul Farmer, who, you know, first worked in Haiti, later Russia, uh, Rwanda and West Africa who himself has worked across uh, geographies and across disciplines. Like he, you know, Paul brought, has brought in the design school to develop, uh, you know, develop hospitals in Rwanda. And he himself has just finished like a 700 page historical analysis of health in West Africa. So, you know, deeply, deeply historical, deeply anthropological. So you've got him and Becker is a psychiatrist working on uh, psychiatry and anthropology, looking at eating disorders and how penetration of ideas through, through the media uh, changed eating habits in, in Fiji, for example, is one of her, her, her great works. And I trained as first as a biochemist and an immunologist and then left that and went into anthropology and medicine thereafter. And so, you know, and I have spent most of my time, I, you know, I started by looking at neoliberalism and late 20th century capitalism and its effects on, on ideas of health delivery, but then really moved into thinking about supply chain and policy frameworks. And so, so all of us were coming to this with with very practical experience on the ground on health delivery questions, but also multiple uh, disciplines. And I think what we realized and what we have realized as the course has continued over you know, the last decade plus is that, you know, that we have to think of innovative ways to bring 
this type of biosocial analysis together in a, in a cohesive way. So, and we do it by, you know, we of course teach most of the lectures, but we also occasionally will have people come from the law school to talk about accountability and different processes that you can hold, you know, uh, uh, complex bureaucracies accountable for what's happening without or governments. We brought in people who can help us understand prisons and prison culture and what's going on in prisons and health or understanding the media. And, and the teaching fellows, we, we tend to draw from the Graduate School of Art and Sciences or the, or the School of Public Health, sometimes the medical school. And we, I, we have this incredible staying power with our teaching staff. We, our head TF, start, our current head TF started teaching for us when she was a graduate student 10 years before. And now she's a junior faculty member and she still takes on the role of doing that. And, and we had another gentleman who was also a student in the past who's now leading the media and medicine program, who still teaches in the course. So we have this really incredible team of people that are dedicated to this type of cross-disciplinary thinking around healthcare. So it's it's been really organic and really amazing. And, you know, and because of that, people are like, oh, what about, you know, you should talk about this, you should talk about that. And we're kind of, you know, it's just, it kind of flows every year what we do based on you know, as we're the way the four of us are seeing the world. And that may change as, you know, as people retire and move on. But I think it's it's been a really incredible experience. That's great. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. And, and it's really interesting for me to hear you, you know, contrast these these different components of a cohort of people who are themselves interdisciplinary in their work, but maybe from a similar background themselves. And um, I see Fawaz with his hand up, but I, and I was actually going to point out, you know, the, the contrast to Fawaz and Doris, actually, which is very interesting, because they are actually truly from very disparate uh, disciplines. So yeah. well, let's go ahead and say what you were going to say, but I'd also be curious yeah. to hear if that comparison to maybe the way that you and Doris work together, you know, resonates. With yeah, I, I think Sanman talked about something uh, with Ar what he had been working with Arthur, and uh, I'm working with Arthur also on creating or examining technologies that can be helpful for the elderly or what we are taught to be called the uh, not to call them elderly, but call them older people. <laughs> so uh, the, the point is uh, that uh, when we look at uh, these boundaries, we, they look as if they are they're different disciplines, they're, therefore there are boundaries among them and between them, and it's completely inaccurate. I mean, uh, science, the natural world does not divide itself into these separate and contained issues. Uh, also, society drives us into looking at things in a more of an organic way and more of an interlaced way. Uh, when, when we, the word interdisciplinarity, I really think it's very important to realize it's not a substitute for general education. It's not a, it's really a way of expanding conventional knowledge and expanding these boundaries and making sure that there are topics that can be integrated and synthesized in a way uh, that is really essential for creating the right solutions. So uh, in, in many ways, uh, when we talk about uh, you know, employing uh, interdisciplinarity, it's really a natural step. Every time you want to examine subject or examine a uh, topic or question or an issue, what you're doing basically is you're taking a process of achieving some integrative synthesis, which is really the essence of uh, the interdisciplinarity. It's not, interdisciplinarity is not a subject matter or it's not really a body of content even. Uh, it's, it's a process. And this is really very important to, to keep in mind as we're talking with this group here today. Uh, so uh, integrate this part of the synthesis here is uh, where art is. And, uh, and it, art is really an amazing medium it creates social, we, we examined it in the course with Doris in many different ways and we had people coming and talking with us about it. It integrates so many things. It also creates sociability. It creates ways of discussion and collaborations. Uh, when I taught in the design school, uh, uh, I, I used the studio format that they have there and it was really an amazing format for problem solving. So some of our courses in, for instance, in 96 and ES 96, we try to bring the students to a format where they work collaboratively, they, they think collaboratively. At the same time, each has their own contribution and each one of them probably, or they're divided into many engineering disciplines, they come with their disciplines and disciplines are extremely important. What, when, we think, when I think of interdisciplinarity, I think it's, a, it's a grounded in the disciplines. It's uh, without having uh, 
disciplines, uh, you can't really create interdisciplinarity. And the other way through, interdisciplinarity is, is essential for future development of a discipline. So you, you see the interaction between the two and how these feed into each other's in a, in a very productive way. So I, I think um, the, the, the way we I interacted with Doris, although you said we came from very diverse areas, yes, we did. And we met by pure accident in a fundraising event and <laughs> we <laughs> clink in each other and we start talking and then we developed this course. And in many ways, we complement each other's. In many ways, I learned from Doris a lot of things, and uh, I take into uh, that very seriously because uh, we taught together in the same classroom, and uh, we. I was very much humbled by sometimes how she thought about things and how she she uh, explained things. And my my point here is that the students learn from that. The students are sitting watching two people who are interacting dynamically and coming with some question and answers to each other and to the students. So we formed really a, a like a cluster of intellectual discussion rather than this is your turn, my turn. It's really more of a fluid in many different ways. And by the way, I just want to put a blog on this one here is that Vikram who is here on the call, Vikram uh, is and I, we do a very similar thing in the course we teach. Uh, which is around particularly around the human challenges. Uh, so the course, although the course is really a design course, looking at fundamentals of design, looking at philosophical underpinning of design, it went into many directions that we were not sure that we didn't think about them even. Uh, it was brought up by the students, driven by the students, and they 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 brought up the subject, they brought up the issues, they brought up the challenges. Some of them we turn it around and ask them to think about them and solve them. Some of them we try to solve them in the, in the class itself. Yeah, so it was, it was for me, is a very different experience from anything I thought, whether it's in optics or MEMS or whatever. It's, it's a very uh, fluid, very dynamic and very much into, so uh, it, in my opinion also, it create a level of trust. It create a level of, of uh, uh, feeling of, the open-endedness of the issues, feeling of the complexity and realizing that complexity, can, you have to learn how to deal with complexity and live with it, not resolve it by removing it and make it less. That's the nature of the beast to speak. So yeah. anyway, let me stop here. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And uh, you know, the, the, you brought up so many interesting points there and, and uh, you know, that, that issue of the questions and the way you handle them and the way the students surface them uh, I'm really looking forward to talking about that. And because I do want to keep the time, I'm actually, Alain, I'm going to let you start our next segment and uh, talk a bit about that because I know that that also is particularly relevant for your course and the, the way that the students really helped to surface those questions and find their own rich questions and the way you, you, you dealt with that. So uh, let's pause here for the end of this segment and I'll turn it back over to Rebecca who can uh, engage some, some audience participation and then we'll, we'll come back in a couple minutes to, to have that conversation. Okay, so hopefully all of you are having all kinds of thoughts at this point that you would like to share with us and questions for the panelists. And I would like to engage us in a structured activity of um, getting those out here and then having a little discussion about them. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to have one minute of silence and no typing while you think about what is a comment or a question that you would like to ask, and actually I shouldn't say no typing, I should mean no pressing enter um, in that first minute. And then at the end of the first minute, I will say go, and everybody should press enter in their Zoom chat and s push a, a question or a thought into that chat. Then we will have another moment, minute, more than a moment for all of us to take a little time to look through what we see there. Um, and then we'll pull a couple things out to talk about. We thought it would be nice to hear from as many of us as possible. So we've engineered to do it this way and then also bring in some of your voices. Um, let me say that you should note if, if you wanna put in a comment but you do not want to be called upon to speak, just let us know in there so that you don't get called on. Um, and let me also note that our second segment is going to be about the in the course experience where we'll get to you know, what kind of activities and how do you assess. You can feel free to comment and ask about those things, but know that those things are coming up um, in the conversation. We'll start with Ella in just a minute. 
So um, right now, let's begin our minute of silence while we all think of some question or comment. Before we all jump into reading all of these, I just want to um, mention for anyone who's wondering that Doris actually had to go to teach. Um, so she was only able to be with us for the first half. So unfortunately, we aren't having her for the second half of this, but you can know that her students are having the benefit of, uh, of her teaching at this point. Okay, I see a slowing of things going into the chat. So please everybody now take a another little silent time to take a look through. So I see um, a, a range of themes here. May I ask um, Ramona, would you be willing to share your comment and then we'll um, have a little bit of response from the panel on it? So my comment is uh, when you encounter common ideas in your different disciplines where the language used to describe these phenomena differ, how do you work together to isolate what is essential across disciplines? Maybe I could maybe not directly answer the question, but uh, uh, you know, as a biologist, uh, at least Brad was wondering why I have a course on entrepreneurship, which is in fact on creativity and entrepreneurship. Uh, and that is not because I played one on TV, but there is some common language between disciplines, and if you if you think about uh, 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 creating a startup or developing you know a project to solve an issue, it's not very different in terms of the steps than what you do in a research lab. You start to think about you know, you know to 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 formulate uh, to to identify a problem, then you uh, uh, start to get an idea how you will solve this problem, then you experiment. And so, you know, in, in, in research, you do experiments and you, and then you get data and all you, you know, you have data before and data after your experiments, and then you have to analyze this data. And then uh, you create a model, which is like creating a prototype, for example, for a business. And then you have to uh, communicate your ideas. You have to engage different people. Uh, so in, in, you know, if you have a startup, you need to, uh, convince people to give you funding to get your your project up to speed. You need to have a budget, you know, uh, uh, model. Uh, when you are a scientist and you do research, you have to convince uh, uh, an agency to give you money, uh, and then you uh, maybe need to build stuff because it's part of what the, the research that you, you are doing. So, so ultimately, and then you need to communicate your ideas, your, your results. So it's either a publication or, or you know, for, in the case of a scientist or putting a, a product on the market if it's a business. But so you have this similarity in, uh, in approaches and, in, in, and so the language is different, but the concepts, are somewhat similar. And that is in part what helped uh, people across disciplines to understand each other because they, uh, they, they, they have, or they went through uh, the same kind of process. And so I think that, you know, that's, that's really uh, uh, helpful to, um, to be able to communicate with, with, with people uh, around you. Thank you, Ellen. That's uh, really helpful. And um, Fawaz, if it's okay, I want to make sure we get to our second segment, so I will move it ahead here. I do want to call out that there is a big theme coming up in the chat, which is more for the administrators like me than for the faculty about how do we incentivize and permit our faculty the time and space that they need to co-teach or to figure out and how to develop and spend time developing and brainstorming. I see this in Salma's comment, in Rachel's, in Carolyn's, in Gabe's. Um, and uh, I, I take that very much to heart as a question for us, if we've got a model of allocating and counting faculty teaching that cuts against this um, really fundamental exploration of how to solve problems that Alan is talking about that is just across disciplines. Um, that's a big challenge for us, um, those of us who are, you know, responsible for balancing the books, so to speak. Um, go ahead, Brad. All right, thank you. Yeah, thankfully I'm not responsible for balancing the books, so that's great. Um, so I would like to shift now into this second segment um, where we're really thinking about how the course ran and particularly the student experience, uh, which I think is, is just so critical as we're thinking about our courses. And 
when Rebecca and I were speaking with each of you as we were planning this session over the last couple of weeks, you know, a thing that jumped out immediately to, to us was just how central in all of these courses the student agency was. Like students are really, they have the ability to mold these courses in different ways actually, uh, but they all have that in, in common. And so I'd love to, to talk, and uh, Alain, I'm gonna start with you to talk about that, but uh, also partially because of time, I'd love for this to just be a bit of a conversation where uh, you know, if, if everyone else has something to add, please go ahead. But just to start, you know, Alain, why was that so important in your course to have students really have agency in determining, you know, how the course experience was for them? And do you think this is something that is actually specific or unique to real world problems or interdisciplinary approaches? Uh, and, and go ahead. Yeah, so I think that uh, uh, we, we wanted to uh, put students in not really in a driver's seat but they, they were helping to 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 drive the course because when you address uh, uh, you know issues real world issues uh, it, w it would be great if there is only one issue uh, and and then everybody will work toward that but we, we felt that um, it was important to, for especially when when uh, it's a course that is based on developing projects, you want to uh, for students to feel a sense of ownership. Yes, yeah? so they don't just run through the project because that's you know project three on a list of ten. Uh, you we want them to be really involved. We want them to go uh, uh, out of uh, you know so, so so the course does not stop. Uh, uh, to what's going on in the classroom. So we, we kind of push them to explore, push them to kind of, in a way, mix their extracurricular uh, experience with, uh, uh, with the course. And to, to, so, so it's, it's in fact cross-disciplinary in, in multiple ways. Uh, it's, it's also, uh, 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 you know, it, it goes beyond uh, just a, a, a course. Uh, 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 with, with lectures, uh, it you know students have to be involved. S students have to feel strongly about the projects they want to develop. And uh, I, I've taught many unusual courses, uh, and 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 I know that uh, it's also on the faculty side the best possible interaction that we have, you can have with students. And I would say you know. A smile from an instructor goes a long way, much further than a differential equation, and 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 so 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 I think it's it's a it's an amazing way to uh, connect with students, and when possible to make a difference. So what we want are we want to kind of have a life changing impact. On students, and we have seen that. We have I've seen that in uh, in the study abroad program uh, uh, when we uh, student students that were you know plan to do pre med then suddenly decide to take a year off and go and work for a nonprofit or create a startup, and so so that's what is important is to kind of make them realize that well, they already realize that that there is there is issues many issues in the world. And it may be uh, important for them when they are in college to start to see what kind of issues they would like to solve. And that's you know, the, the, the main goal of the course. And so you know, we, we assemble the team. Uh, so the, the, the Lehman program, uh, so that's the LP from uh, LPCE and the rest is creativity entrepreneurship. The Lehman program is bigger than the course. There are other type of activities uh, uh, we, we, we have all kinds of things that happen as part of the program. And what we want is to create a community of students, which is rooted in uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, multiple courses. We already have two uh, LPC courses, one that will happen in, in, the, in, in the spring, uh, but we want to, 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 you know, to do something. And, and uh, for example, uh, Doris was talking about art. So we had a workshop at the art lab where students use uh, uh, 
pieces of art to build. To, they, they, we ask them, you know, get an idea, you know, solve something, solve, you know, world hunger or something. And then they got, uh, they had a bit of clay, they had all kind of uh, weird objects, and they had to assemble a little prototype that will represent their project. And so you need you need art. You need to be to be able to perform. So we have like uh, pitch workshops. Uh, you know how you know, how you will communicate your ideas. We create at the end uh, a little. They have to create little videos. And so so you know art, uh, uh, science, humanities. All of that is ultimately combined into these type of courses. And uh, uh, you know, I teach biochemistry, so so I know that our biochemistry is important. But I, I also know that uh, interdisciplinary courses are even more important for 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 the future life of of our students. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so it's interesting because you know that seems it's nice to hear about that you know, very broad definition of of ways students you know are are defining the experience for themselves and Salman. Based on what I know about your course, I know you have a, a very specific way that the students are uh, participating in that. Uh, if I understand it, they have each to choose the, the questions that they're presenting to the faculty in the um, one of the assignments where they're kind of interviewing faculty as uh, part of the, um, I think it's weekly almost. And I just wonder, you know, that's a, clearly they have complete control there, but it's very um, focused in the course. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how uh, you came to that as something that you felt was a really important part. Well, so yeah, we we really debated about how to change it so that it wasn't just a lecture. Because so th so we do a couple of things. One is we we um, you know we'll we'll have a you know out of the seventy five minutes of class, we'll have about fifty to fifty five minutes where we're talking about a subject. And you know people are coming from varied backgrounds, right? So you really have to give a foundation, and then we'll save the last twenty minutes for them to just ask us questions. And the students, of course, it's random. We have no control over it. It goes in various directions. And, um, and it's amazing because they love that. Like the students tell us that this, this, you know, like after we've presented something, if they can kind of interrogate either the topic or how it relates to global health, they feel like they learn a lot from that. And then that, of course, goes, you know, into the sections, right? And the, those conversations continue in the sections. And so they, you know, they're getting the 20 minutes with us each class after the, the lecture portion. And then they're getting another hour with their with their teaching fellows. And it's interesting because you know the discussions that come out of this allow us to identify gaps in students' knowledge because we're trying to tie together the social sciences and the sciences in people that are coming from both. And so we train the teaching fellows to do some really close accompaniment when students don't have knowledge in a certain area or they haven't grasped, let's say, a social theory or something, the teaching fellows then can pick that up from these conversations and come in and give assistance. So we're, you know, we're trying to, to um, yeah, we're trying to innovate in, in giving them, I wouldn't say it's control, but it's more like that they're, you know, that they're able to, or maybe control is the right word, that, you know, they, they can ask anything they want. And in their asking, we learn where gaps in understanding may exist so that we can augment that. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to actually turn it over to Rebecca for our last question, uh, just so we can keep to time. Okay. Um, so this is actually a perfect segue from what you just said, Salman, about the students coming from different backgrounds into the class. We actually have an audience filled with some uh, very experienced teaching and learning professionals here. And I um, expect that many of them are thinking about some of the challenges that come with the course design and particularly the activities and assessment design when you have such varied backgrounds and experiences in the disciplines that the courses draw on. In fact, I saw uh, Zofia and Patrice communicate about this in the chat. So I would love to hear from you about how you think about the activities and particularly the assessments and assessing the work that students do so that, um, you know, so that it's, it's really productive for the students so that they have the push on them to um, really advance their learning through these courses. So um, Fawaz, would you mind if I come to you first on this question to hear about what kinds of uh, assignments and, and activities you have? Uh, I think I'd like to make a little prelude here, which is uh, kind of related to what's been said before, which is uh, Logan 
put it in a very nice way. He said, is this going to be expensive? Is it sustainable? And that's a good way of thinking about it. To me, is the, one of the important things is to ask, what's important and what are we doing? We say we are teaching so students learn, students become critical thinkers, they become good citizens, uh, maybe they can, can collaborate, they need to retain this knowledge, this information. So I think the design itself, the design has to start with these learning goals to start with as, uh, and doesn't matter what course you're dealing with, you have to really look into things that uh, require collaboration, require them to talk to each other, require them to think how we, uh, how they can build on their knowledge and to create something new and innovative. At the end, to me, uh, the assignments are not innovative, doesn't drive innovation, it's useless. Uh, we can today Google everything and we have with machine learning learn so many things. I think there is a really a need in my mind for revamping the curriculum everywhere, not only in engineering, everywhere. Meaning there are so many things right now we teach can be learned through very simple Googling right now and very simple machine learning algorithms. We teach kinematics and I always wonder, you know, machines can do it much better than any human being on earth. Uh, so there are things around that that you need to be to be uh, looked at very carefully. And I think uh, the idea of taking some courses and merging them together to become solid course and becomes much more expensive course is something we look into. Uh, the question of assessment is a very interesting question, is that uh, I, I truly believe if the students are self-motivated, they're interested in something, they learn it better, they retain it more, and they'll do better at the end. If you force them to do something because there is an exercise or there is a set of questions that they need to answer by tomorrow before five in the evening, most of the time it's really kind of a, you end up with junk in, junk out. And uh, I've seen it over and over in many courses I've taught. I, I think it's really important to questions to be dealt with in a way that is, it's, it's obvious. Many times in some courses I teach, I ask them to evaluate themselves. I ask their peers to evaluate them and ask who helped who. And we did a map of these things and we put them out. We show it to people, you know. I, I learned from Rebecca and Rebecca learned from Elaine and Elaine learned from Denise and Vikram helped Juan and so on and so forth. And that's, that's really what makes it a community and that's what makes it a learning experience. Otherwise it's a downloading and downloading proven over and over doesn't work. Not in this century at least. Thank you, Fawaz. Um, Salman, would you give a perspective from dealing with a, a large course? The other two at the moment are relatively on the smaller side of how you think about assessment. Well, I think Fawaz has hit the nail on the head. You know, we're trying to get people to collaborate across disciplines, which suggests that you want to have collaboration right, in the first place. So the assignments have to be designed that way. The second thing is you're getting people, you're trying to encourage them to, to read things that they may not be comfortable reading at first and tying things together in ways that they may not be used to. So when we started, we actually had these kind of perspective papers that people would write every week. And then we found that people were getting really stressed because if you're just learning how to pull ideas from different places, it's kind of hard to write these things. And so we thought, okay, let's give people the time to read and not stress them out with that. Instead, let them come to class and the, section, the sections will begin with a, with a grounding question. So something that we thought that's important, like just a written answer that you write, you know, for two minutes, you know, what do you think the main idea from such and such was, right? Now, some people could say, wow, that sounds like a pop quiz, <laughs> except it's not. It's kind of a grounding question because it grounds the discussion. And if, if your answer seems to have lots of gaps, again, we work with our teaching fellows to say, that's the student you need to call to talk to, maybe guide them, talk through the material, et cetera, right? So that's what we're trying to do. And of course, we're trying to, you know, we have like, we have 12 sections. And so, you know, we're working with the teaching fellows to maintain, to maintain the quality of that across the, across the sections. The other thing that we try to do is be, to foster collaboration. That's one where we, you know, we don't have, we don't have people writing their own things. There's encouraged to talk to each other. The second thing is even the, the, the final paper, we base it on a prospectus mm -hmm. that you write about an idea that you're interested in. So let's say I want to look at how 2.5 micron air particles uh, relate to diabetes. And, you know, and I, so I want to, and maybe I, I'm just a biologist. And I really don't understand 
uh, things about carbon and fossil fuels. So I want to talk to other people. So you'd write a pers prospectus and then you can either write a final paper where of course you can talk to whoever you want, or you can have an open book three hour final exam where you write on that topic. And you can call your mother, you can call Fawaz, you can call anybody that you want as long as you produce the work. So the idea is there's no cheating, there's no anything like that. There's you there's like, you are encouraged to collaborate because that's what we want you to do. I actually think every class at Harvard should be like that. I think we should be encouraging our students to help each other with problem sets, assignments, and collaboration, and take away this whole element that you're working on your own to do something. But anyway, we're trying to do that in this course. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear in both of these cases that the, the communication and the iterativity of the relationship with the students and helping them to figure out where there is the gap that needs to be filled in is at the core of it. This and Re um, Rebecca, sorry, just to pick up there, like, I feel like that's like, theoretically, we always say this, but we don't actually do this. If you cannot communicate an idea to the children, to the students, have you failed or have they failed? If, if failure is even a term in this whole game, right? And so you, you really, I think what we're trying to do is turn the table around and say, you know, we are trying to deliver a set of ideas to people who are very capable of understanding them. And we need to figure out how best to do that. And the ways that we've been using for, you know, for a long time may not be the ideal methods. That is such a good final word that I'm going to pass it to Brad right there for our conclusion. Great, thanks. Yeah, so as we wrap up, what I'd like to do is just have one more opportunity for us all to share thoughts and we'll we'll do a very similar, uh, do this a similar way to what we did with Rebecca earlier, where uh, in a moment, we'll just give everyone a minute. And then this, uh, this time, what I'd like you to think about is just something that, you know, thinking back to this really interesting conversation we just had, was there something that really, you know, in this conversation triggered a thought for you that maybe you hadn't had before some new piece of uh, learning or a new thought, new connection that you made or uh, something that was just particularly striking to you. I would uh, think we'd all really love to see uh, what this conversation meant to, to everyone. So take a minute now and think about that. And then I will, as we did before, let everyone hit enter at the same time and we can all uh, read those together. All right, I hope we're all ready. So why don't you go ahead and on the count of three, you can hit enter one, two, and three. And as we see these come through, we can take another moment and read them. And uh, maybe we'll have a moment, if we have in our final minute or two, maybe we can hear from the panelists if they have any thoughts about any of these particular. All right, well, I think, you know, one thing that's, that's clear here is just the power of this approach, which has, you know, been mentioned multiple times. And maybe as a final thought, if one of our panelists or more, you know, could really just talk to the way that this, experiencing this approach, and we've heard a little bit about this already, but experiencing this approach has really just changed the way that you approach, you know, maybe your other classes or, you know, has this, I feel like one thing we've heard a lot of is that once we get this, catch this bug of thinking about our courses in an interdisciplinary way, that it just seeps into uh, the way we think about this more broadly. Well, Brad, just, I can start this off by saying that, you know, when you start to look, I think Doris put it very nicely. When you start to look at a problem, you realize that it's actually linked to so many other things that you hadn't thought of. And, you know, I, as we're looking, I, I just I put in the comment things that you know these these great problems of our time that a university like ours needs to address, things you know ranging from pluralism to looking at the environment and the environment and health and you know changes that you know, like all, they're not going to be solved by having one discipline try to attempt to capture it. It's going to really require interdisciplinary thinking. And one of the thoughts that was put down is well, what does it mean if our students don't have access to this thinking? And I think that's the question we should all be asking, right? Like, what are we, what, are, you know, what, are, what kind of student are we trying to train? What kind of thinker, critical thinker are we trying to train? Right? They shouldn't be mimicking what we've done. The idea is to create new ways of approaching the world and problems. And so if we aren't fostering interdisciplinary teaching or research, I think we leave our students at a disadvantage and we don't fulfill our goal, which is what I think our goal should be as one of the great universities of the world, to take on these challenges of our time. So I think it's incumbent on us to get this right. Somebody wrote, make sure that every, you, everything you're doing, that you're testing the heck out of it. I think that's right. We need to be innovative. We need to test that our innovations are pushing things in the right direction. But I, I hope our students are going to be greater thinkers than we are as a result of this. I think uh, every time I think about the word innovation, 
innovation. And I think about the world behind us, around us. And what happened last maybe 70 years, maybe 80 years in the world, the last 20 years, the improvement that you've taken place and what took, what happens, I can't imagine it done through disciplines. <laughs> in fact, I don't know of any of the important innovation took place into a single discipline. Social media is a very good example of that and so on and so forth. We can go over many. The question is really, uh, when you are looking at a broad uh, group of diverse disciplines. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. I don't think, again, I want to emphasize this. I don't think diver uh, uh, the question of uh, interdisciplinarity could work without strengths in disciplines. That's, that's not possible. But then when you are looking at creating solutions, when you're looking at exercising innovations, creativity, this is where you need the mix between all of these disciplines to come together. Uh, one thing I also want to emphasize that the process is very important. I know for sure, I can speak for myself. What I learned at Harvard long, long time ago, and I went out to the world, I didn't really use most of it. And it really, what's important is we have to teach students, and I, everyone says that, and we need to act on it, is that they have to learn how to learn and be critical thinkers. On top of that, I would say with this situation we have right now, we need to have a level of sociability between folks, between students, faculty, that can interact freely with respect and humility. And if we don't have that, we're going to kill each other. That has to really change. This idea of teacher and, and student and this hierarchical models that we implemented the last 100 years, that has to go away. We have to start thinking very different and we need to come up with uh, a, a collaborative way of learning that include the faculty too. Uh, I think Logan mentioned also, again, I heard his, his comment that uh, I learned a whole lot from this course. I learned a whole lot from when I talk with Vikram, when I talk with, uh, I, I teach technical courses. I also teach them collaboratively. Just for uh, Rebecca's sake here, uh, we had three courses in nanomaterials and we combine them together to become two. And we are talking now, combine them together to become one. And so faculty still, we need to recognize that they are there. If I'm with Salman on the same course and we are together there, we should, uh, our effort should be accounted as if I'm teaching by myself. That's for her to decide, Rebecca. <laughs> well, it's a great and provocative uh, series of thoughts to end on. And so I just really wanna thank all of our panelists, thank the audience for their great participation and interest and for this great conversation. Uh, thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.